Hi guys, it's Swank Ivy again. I'm not doing a letter for you this time, though in a way I'm talking about all my letters. All the nasty ones, anyway. Uh, this is going to be more like a mini program of sorts instead of one of my usual videos, because this is a pretty big topic, and so I want to cover it comprehensively. You better get comfortable. Don't worry, I have pictures. So, more than half the time, when I get a nasty letter, it's about how I'm not really asexual because I really have whatever problem some jerk decides to assign to me without even knowing me. But recently, I realized that in some cases, I'm going about my defenses all wrong. Seriously. Most of my approaches have been framed in the voice of the unassailable asexual. Most of you probably don't know what that is. I sure didn't until I accidentally came across some videos mentioning it. And I realized I had a thing or two to say about this. See, despite all the visibility work I do, I'm actually not super active in the asexual community itself. Um, I do a lot of work for it, but there are sometimes things I miss within it. So a group channel that does visibility and discussion videos for asexuality did a whole series on the unassailable asexual. And David J followed up with one later. So just like him, I kind of recognized myself in the description, like big time. Let me explain a little. See, especially when it comes to visibility work, there's sort of this goal for the spokesperson to be like a role model, of course. So somebody who can't be challenged is great to have. Uh, basically they expect you to have all these positive qualities or so-called normal qualities and to be pretty much relatable to the outside world in every way except that you're asexual. So, I mean, this expectation isn't just from the sexual world either, it's from the asexual world too, and it makes us look good if these well-adjusted people with no problems are the ones doing the talking. So, it's so easy to blame some minor glitch or non-normative trait and assign it the cause of the asexuality so people won't want to change their preconceived notions. Um, and they won't have to, they'll feel that they won't have to. But then people like me pop up and they actually have to listen because there's nothing left to blame it on. And a lot of the time I've been answering their accusations with like, no I'm not, rather than no I'm not, but it wouldn't matter if I was. Okay, so before I get too deep into this, I should shoot off a list of the qualities that the so-called gold star asexual possesses, more or less. They're healthy have no past or current problems with their bodies or minds, and aren't on any drugs that could be messing with their sex drive, etc. They've never had sexual abuse. They're extroverted, or they're introverted but still have lots of friends and aren't shy. They're cisgender. They're sex positive for others and indifferent to sex themselves. They don't have a libido. They're not too young and not too old. They're right in the sweet spot, where they're supposedly too old to be a late bloomer, but too young to have a lessened sex drive. The list cites 20 to 40, but ideally above 25 for women. They're physically attractive, and have competency in the social arenas. And they are aromantic or sometimes heteroromantic. So, it's kind of hard to believe, but I hit every single one of these. and I didn't even realize that this was going on out there. All these things supposedly come together and make this complete package of well-adjusted, happy people who are only different from everybody else in that they don't feel sexual attraction. And these gold star asexuals are put on display and made examples of, as if this is a good representative of the asexual community. Well, first of all, I should say, this whole thing is not really even completely foolproof, because the so-called unassailable asexual still gets people walking away from the conversation saying, yeah, right, just holding tight to those dumb little beliefs that make them feel better, like she was abused and doesn't remember it, or she's just repressing her lesbian desires, or whatever. There really is no truly perfect person to carry this message, because just admitting to asexuality automatically gives you flaws in some people's eyes. Nothing you can do about it. But anyway, uh, the main reason it's a bad idea to have most of the talking heads fit this description is that asexuals are as diverse as sexual people are. There's just as many of us who have a traumatic past, or physical or mental disorders, or aren't particularly attractive, or whatever, 
but that doesn't mean those things should be continuously cited as if they're actually legit reasons to dismiss asexuality as a possibility for those people. And I really don't like the idea that you can only be accepted as asexual um, if the big deciders out there have ruled out all the other possibilities. So even though I did it inadvertently, um, I helped contribute to that message because of some of the stuff I said, and sometimes in my videos or other times in my media I'll reinforce this. I don't think anything I said was wrong, but I think in some cases it was incomplete or sent the wrong message because I debunked the criticisms for myself and pointed out how they didn't apply to me, rather than showing people how these things would not give them the right to designate my asexuality or asexuality in general as a disorder if they were true. So I want to deconstruct these really problematic misconceptions one by one. And at the end, I'll give you a follow-up about how being a gold star asexual has affected my life. Myth number one. If you're sick, mentally or physically, that's why you're asexual. I've always been a healthy kid. Never broke a bone, never had a serious illness, never had a cavity. I've never been to a psychiatrist or had to take medication for any emotional, mental, or neurological issue, and I've never been diagnosed with any non-normative condition. But that doesn't mean people who are both living with an illness or condition and asexual should be viewed like their asexuality is only a symptom. So yeah, it's true that some medications affect sex drive or mood, so they could affect sexual interest, but sexual attraction isn't the same thing as sex drive in the first place. And also, if someone is a lifelong sufferer of a disorder, it's not anyone else's business to assign that person's sexual orientation to the list of symptoms. It's also true that lack of inclination toward physically intimate relationships is more common in people in the autistic spectrum. So sure, these things are sometimes related, but does that mean the non-autistic majority gets to step in and discredit asexuality itself because of it, or delegitimize high-functioning autistic people's experience of asexuality? No, it does not. I don't have any health problems, don't have mental illness, don't have autism, and I'm not on any medications, but that doesn't mean people who do fall into these categories should be understood as less legitimate as far as asexuality is concerned. My pal Vlad here does videos for an asexual channel, and she's a legally blind albino with high-functioning autism, and I somehow doubt that her perspective is any less important than mine. It's not less real because it may be linked in some way to her autism or anything else. And my pal Natalie has done a few videos about her experience being an intersex asexual. She's an XY female with Swire syndrome. It's likely her atypical hormones and whatnot contributed to the way she feels about sex, sure. But does that mean she's not a type of asexual who's just as real as I am? Don't think so. She's one way to be asexual. As far as I know, I don't have any unusual aspects of my biology, but if I did and I was asexual, I'd still expect my orientation to be taken seriously rather than talked about like it's a symptom. This is to say, nobody should be suggesting that anyone with a disability, physical or mental illness, non-neurotypical orientation, atypical biology, or medical prescription is asexual because of it, or that if it's involved somehow, the asexuality isn't real. And that goes for people inside and outside the community. It's not for anyone but the person involved to say. Myth number two. If you've been sexually abused, that's why you're asexual. In one of my other videos about this topic, I revealed that I have never been sexually abused, and I spent most of that video talking about the philosophy behind that assumption, why people think it must have happened if I don't want sex because not wanting sex is such a serious issue, but I didn't talk about what it might mean if someone claiming to be asexual had some sexual abuse, and I didn't give any nods to the legitimacy of those people's orientation despite their experiences. It's true that some asexual people have been molested. It's also true that being molested or sexually assaulted doesn't necessarily cause a person to swear off sex, so it stands to reason that the reverse is true too. Asexuality is about lack of attraction, not fear or revulsion that's based in trauma. It's true that things that happen to us can affect us permanently, so I'm not going to say all asexuals with abuse in their pasts are unaffected by it. But a person's asexual identity doesn't lose legitimacy if the abuse has helped contribute to who they are. Things that happen to us always help make us who we are, but big identity issues don't usually have one linchpin. For instance, if you got taken to the orchestra as a child, and you were so inspired by the violinist that you dedicated your life from that point on to becoming a concert musician, would anyone point at that one event and act like it was a shame that it helped make you who you were? 
that you could have or should have been someone else if that hadn't affected you so deeply? Or did it affect you that way because you were the type of person who already had such an appreciation inside? So anyway, in short, I support the idea that trauma should be dealt with and healed if possible, but I don't support the idea that asexuality is all too likely to be one of its symptoms. Myth number three. If you're introverted or shy, that's why you're asexual. First, it's a common misconception that introverts are shy. Technically, I'm an introvert, and we know I'm not shy. It has to do with how a person uses energy, really. And I'm a person who gravitates towards spending time alone when it's my choice to make. I was a little on the shy side when I was a kid, I guess, but today I'm very social and I make friends easily. But there are a lot of asexuals who don't have a lot of social skills or prefer to stay away from other people, and even though their introversion is not a social phobia or a disorder, a lot of people believe introverts should try to become extroverts somehow, which isn't really possible. If it's upsetting them that they don't have many friends, sure, they could do with some social interaction to make that happen, but not everyone even wants to. And unfortunately, being alone is often lumped into the pathetic category in our society, and people associate a preference for solitude with an inability to meet people and get laid. So basically, people think these introverts are failing to interact sexually out of fear, poor social skills, abject nerdiness, what have you. But being a bit of a loner isn't necessarily tied up with asexuality. There are plenty of so-called social morons out there who very much want to get laid, you know? And while there may be some personality traits that are more highly correlated with asexuality than with the general population, it's not helpful at all to point at someone's introversion and say it's the reason that person's asexual. And it's certainly not cool to push them into social situations because you think that person must be sad the way they are and would be happier if they were meeting folks and getting laid. Just let them make that decision, and if they want your help, maybe they'll ask you. Don't assume they need it, because there's nothing more obnoxious than having someone do you favors you don't want and tell you it's for your own good. Myth number four. If you're transsexual or outside the gender binary, that's why you're asexual. Well, these arguments are starting to sound kind of similar, aren't they? Yeah, that's because they are. So, it seems asexuality occurs at a higher rate amongst the trans and non-binary gender community. And some people attribute this to people, especially trans people, not being comfortable behaving sexually or feeling attracted to others in a body they feel doesn't fit who they are inside. Sure, there's some truth to that, and sure, sometimes transsexuals start developing sexual attraction or sexual feelings toward their preferred genders once they've gotten to a place in their transitions where it feels natural. That's the sort of thing that happened to Kaylee here. She was very active in asexuality forums, but somewhere along the line during her transition, she realized she's a sexual person. Of course, we still love her as an ally, and she's got an awesome perspective of what we go through since this was her identity for a long time before this new sexuality thing came into her life. But it's important to note that, number one, trans people don't always experience what Kaylee did. And number two, gender isn't about sexuality, though of course those things can be related. A lot of the time, you hear about asexual people finding an asexual community and realizing it's okay to be asexual, and awareness about asexuality is more common in the trans community, so it's very possible some of the overlap is due to more awareness of each other in our communities. I know of a trans guy who IDs as asexual, Sassy here in one of his videos, and I'd sure hate to hear anyone trying to tell him he's only asexual because of some issue he's sure to have related to his body or his transition. Sassy and others like him are one more way a person can be asexual, and there's nothing valuable to be gained by blaming his orientation on being trans. I happen to be a cisgender female, and I'm asexual despite that, so why assume that the tiny minority of asexual trans people are asexual because they're trans?